Dylan has a much better uh, head of hair, so I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, to represent him today. So always a pleasure to be at the Sea Lice Conference. Thank you for giving me the time. <clears throat> I'm glad that I have 20 minutes and not five, and I'll try and make sure I adhere to that. So uh, Dylan is uh, my PhD student. Uh, he wasn't able, so he sends his regrets, says hello to all of you here that he knows. Um, and uh, he was doing some work with myself and researchers uh, in uh, New Brunswick at the St. Andrews Biological Station. Uh, that was actually close to where I attended my first sea lice meeting. I think that was 2002, maybe? Um, so it's been a long time, 20 years. Uh, so uh, Dylan's work was looking at assessing evolution of virulence in the salmon louse, uh, Lepsalmonis, in the, in the Bay of Fundy. So why do we assess evolution of virulence? Uh, why are we interested? Um, and why do we think it might be an issue between uh, wild and, uh, and farmed fish? So an unintended co uh, potential consequence of intensive uh, salmon farming is the, is the potential for uh, influencing evolution of virulence in parasites and pathogens. So there's been some uh, data that's, uh, that was shown, I think, uh, in the early 2000s, work on flavobacterium and out of uh, Finland, I think, was the first set of studies showing evolution of virulence in that particular bacterial species on, on salmon farms. Uh, there was some work uh, by Ogovic uh, et al. out of Norway, also showing that uh, sea lice at farm sites, oh, that's getting smaller, uh, can inflict uh, greater skin damage uh, on their host uh, and produce, uh, reproduce uh, more rapidly, suggesting that <coughs> uh, they were becoming more virulent on the host. So the idea being there's a, there's a set of factors uh, that might be driving this, but the, the fact that on the farm you're, you keep um, removing fish and, and bringing new fish in every, every two years, you're removing potentially some of those negative consequences of increased virulence in the, in the parasite. That would be the, the, the idea. Um, so the, um, at this point, we haven't really seen uh, or even tried to quantify that in, in Canada, so that was the uh, idea behind uh, Dylan's work. Do we have highly virulent strains uh, of sea lice in aquaculture sites in the Bay of Fundy? Are they any different from the, from the wild source uh, uh, lice? And this could obviously have downstream app, uh, implications for wild populations uh, uh, due to uh, uh, spillover. The, Wild populations in Atlantic Canada are extremely low and, and, uh, and at risk in pretty much every river system uh, in Atlantic Canada, just for, for background. Uh, so this was a collaborative effort uh, from, uh, between Aquabounty, University of Prince Edward Island, uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, uh, with our uh, hypothesis that farmed uh, lice uh, what would have an increased uh, impact or increased skin damage uh, to their host based on some of these other uh, findings. <clears throat> So what's, what's impacting uh, uh, increased virulence and then what, uh, what are examples of increased virulence? How do, we, how do we assess that? So we have potentially, you know, higher density of fish on the farms. We have uh, potentially limited uh, broodstock uh, uh, genetic diversity, continued supply of naive hosts. All these things might make it ideal for the parasite to uh, continue to uh, evolve to be more impactful on its host without any negative uh, fitness costs. Uh, and then what would be the, what would be that imp the, uh, the uh, spillover impact potential on, uh, on wild populations? Examples of virulence and how we might assess that, as, uh, as in the Ogovic study, we can, we can look at um, uh, uh, grossly uh, Im impacts uh, to the skin, which uh, Suji, uh, Su Suji uh, sorry about that, Susie, uh, that Susie just showed. Um, so uh, greater damage at the, at the attachment site. We heard from Ina and her group about uh, potential uh, things that the, the lice can secrete and immunomodulate its hosts. Uh, these uh, secretory proteins uh, could potentially um, uh, be uh, virulence factors and enhance the impacts that the, the louse is having on its, on its host. So we developed a challenge model to determine virulence uh, of uh, salmon louse, uh, a culture of uh, sea lice originating from farmed hosts, and a culture of uh, sea lice originating from uh, wild hosts were reared under identical conditions to determine whether there was a, a genetic basis uh, for, for virulence between these two. Uh, and then it was a common garden experiment was completed to test whether lice uh, originating from the farm were more or less uh, susceptible than those originating uh, from the wild. 
Um, we ran that out for four generations. So lice were collected from the field. I'll show, I think that's the next one here. Yeah, we have wild source lice were collected uh, here uh, from Miramichi, as they're returning to Miramichi River. Uh, and then we have farmed uh, source lice were collected from uh, net pens in the, in the Bay of Fundy. They were brought back to the lab, and then uh, three generations were run through uh, in the lab, um, and the fourth generation was utilized for our infection trial. So we wanted to eliminate some of those environmental uh, impacts that, would, that could uh, uh, in, uh, bias our data uh, to begin with. So we ran it out for several generations before we wanted to look at what, uh, what this true impact would be. So in the fourth generation, uh, we have cobopodids, uh, 50 uh, lice per fish, uh, were used to infect uh, 15 Atlantic salmon uh, in each tank, and then we had triplicate tanks per lice source. So we'd have three um, wild uh, tanks and three uh, farm source tanks. Lice were then reared until two months post-molt uh, to, uh, to adults. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we had adult males and adult females uh, by the end to do uh, some of the lesion scoring. But we also assessed at different uh, time points as well. So uh, just actually very similar to what uh, Susie talked about. Uh, lice samples were collected at the cobopodid uh, life stage as well as the calamus 2 and then at adult males and females. So the end goal was to assess uh, lesion development and whether there was an impact on the skin, but we have uh, different things that we were trying to also assess uh, um, uh, throughout, the, throughout the study from uh, different uh, life stages of the, of the parasite. Okay, so to start, and this was uh, a good thing uh, off the bat, was we had the same infection level uh, between the farmed and the wild source. So if there was going to be any um, impact or, or differential virulence between the two or greater impacts between the two, it wasn't going to be confounded by us having a really high infection in the, in the farmed uh, or, the, or the wild source uh, 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 lice. So overall abundances were comparable between the wild and farmed uh, source lice uh, throughout the study. Then when we get to the lesion scoring, uh, we followed uh, uh, the paper by uh, Stuart Johnson et al. 1996 to do one sort of assessment, a gross uh, scoring that could be done visually, uh, and then we did uh, another um, uh, quantitative assessment using ImageJ, which I'll, which I'll talk about. Um, for those of you not familiar with, uh, with the Johnson study, basically there's um, uh, a score from zero to five uh, that, are, that are made at different uh, sites on the, on the fish. So again, similar to what you saw uh, Susie present, uh, you're, the, the main areas where some of these lesions uh, develop from the parasite tend to be on the, on the head, around the dorsal fin, and, uh, and the perianal region or base of the, of the anal fin. So those were assessed, and if there was no impact, that would be a zero, and then you have uh, increasing impacts, so some grazing, discoloration, epidermal uh, removal, or complete uh, epidermis and dermis removed, exposing the musculature. We never got to this, uh, to this stage in these, in these animals, but that was uh, what was developed by uh, Stuart, uh, Stuart et al. Johnson et al., but Stuart and his group. Uh, so this is uh, a distribution of the, of the different uh, lesions that we saw over the, over the course of the study, or Dylan saw. I was sitting in the office not doing any of this. Um, and you can see, uh, to, to begin with, that we actually um, had uh, a large number of the, of the animals had, had low to no uh, lesion development. So had scores of zero, almost 50% of the wild source uh, lice uh, were, were showing uh, no, no lesion development, no impact on the, on the skin. As we go up in um, uh, le uh, lesion scoring and, and more severe impacts, we actually see that we're getting more of those um, lesions occurring in the, in the farm source lice. So from score zero, we see there's more of those in the wild source. Score one, more in the wild source. And then as we get up to scores two, three, and four, they're all more in the, in the farm source lice. And uh, if we look at this, per site, so say the perianal region or the dorsal region, or combine them all together, they were all significantly uh, uh, greater um, scores in the farm source versus the wild source. So that's in line with what was, what was shown in the, in the Olgovic study uh, out, of, out of Norway. Uh, we wanted to look at it a little bit differently too. Um, so all of these animals uh, were, uh, uh, pictures were taken, had to get the lighting right. It, it was uh, quite a production uh, from what I uh, was told. Um, 
And the idea basically was take pictures of all of these uh, different settlement sites and potential uh, uh, lesion, lesion sites and then import those pictures into ImageJ and identify uh, these, uh, these lesions through that software. So the lesions would be outlined in yellow, um, as you can see here, and then a reference site uh, in the same type of tissue would, be, would also be collected and, and outlined in green. Um, and then, uh, so you'd have a mean grayscale measured for each lesion and, uh, and the healthy tissue sections. Uh, and you basically, lesions are typically uh, expo exposed white tissue. There is usually some discoloration, which made it uh, a little bit easier in, in this grayscale to, to identify them. And then similar to what we saw, uh, or what Dylan saw in the, um, in the gross scoring uh, without, um, uh, without using ImageJ analysis, uh, again, the, uh, the lesions were uh, significantly greater in the farm source lice uh, compared to the wild source. Uh, I think this is, oh yeah, this is overall. So again, uh, we were scoring four different regions. Uh, all four regions were consistently higher in the, in the, um, in the farm source lice. So it wasn't, there was no impact of, of sight, like that they were more severe in the head or, or anything like that. In general, you can see that the, the average score is about two and a half uh, for the farm source and, and the wild source would be more uh, around one, one and a half. So that gave us an idea of, okay, we've got gross impacts that are, uh, we're able to quantify and consistent uh, regardless of kind of the method we're, we're using. Uh, now we want uh, to move uh, towards trying to identify what is, what's driving this. Are there, are there particular uh, virulence factors in the, in the parasite that are uh, more highly expressed or that are uh, differentially expressed? So Dylan has just started uh, going down this road, uh, so it's not complete, but I'll kind of go through a little bit of the data that, that he has. Um, so he's uh, our group, but Dylan's done a lot of this, kind of developing an RNA uh, sequencing pipeline for, for the work. Um, what we'll talk about today, because we're collecting uh, lice uh, at these different life stages, but also the, the host uh, tissue at the attachment site and away from the attachment site, as has been explained by Ina and, and Susie and other people uh, uh, this week. Um, all I'm going to talk about is the, the, uh, the lice analysis uh, for today. So, um, oh, wrong one. So basically, uh, the sequence reads were done at uh, Genome, Genome Quebec, and then there's a, a fast QC a quality check of the, of the reads. Uh, adapters are trimmed, and then basically, he was using um, a star to align these reads to the, to the to the uh, reference genome. Uh, the feature counts uh, are then used uh, to generate uh, count tables, and basically those feature counts are, are then, are, or EDGE R and uh, DEseq are used to assess whether there's differential gene expression between the, between the two sources. And that's where we get to these fun little uh, Venn uh, diagrams. I think uh, individually, I won't walk you through um, what he's got here, but uh, more on the individual uh, stages. So this just shows uh, whether you're looking at copepoded, calamus to adult male, adult female, that the farm source lice have an upregulation uh, of uh, certain genes compared to uh, the farm source. Uh, sorry, compared to the wild source, stumbling over it. So you'd have 344 uh, genes are uh, upregulated in the farm source compared to the wild source. And that was consistent across the different life stages. That um, the numbers changed, but in general, there was an upregulation of uh, certain uh, pathways in the, in, the, in, the, in the farm source compared to the wild source. Um, so there's been a little bit of work done uh, by Dylan trying to, uh, trying to assess what these genes are. Um, as, uh, as I mentioned, one of the things that we're, we're interested in, if we think that the parasite, uh, its virulence is increasing, there needs to be some way that it's uh, impacting the host or something that's in contact with the host for it to have that greater uh, impact or, or driving uh, greater lesion uh, development. Um, so we usually try and think of, well, is it something the parasite's secreting uh, onto the host? So one way to, to assess that in, in one aspect is to look at these genes and just see if there's, uh, if there's 
there's a signal peptide or, or a, a way that would suggest that the genes you're looking at are, are destined through a, a, to some uh, secretory pathway. What that is, we don't know. Is that coming in contact with a host? We can't say, but it, it's an initial um, assessment of the, of the differential uh, gene expression at this point. So, and basically all we're, all we're seeing here is that a significant number of the, of the genes that are um, being upregulated by these, uh, these farm source lice uh, do have a signal uh, peptide sequence uh, up to 50% in, in some cases. So maybe these are uh, involved in, in some um, secretions that uh, would come in contact with the, with the host. At this point, though, we're, we're still in the, in the early days of that. There was a little bit of... Uh, of uh, ontology analysis and go term uh, assessment that uh, Dylan was able to walk through. So we see that in those uh, increased uh, number of genes that are uh, expressed in the cobopoded uh, wild, uh, sorry, farm versus wild, uh, we can break them down a little bit. So we have uh, a number of C-type lectins, a, a lot of chitin binding that seems to be impact. So is there is there something uh, in terms of um, how the, how the uh, the fish itself might be sensing, uh, sensing the louse because uh, we know that uh, uh, chitin from the louse can induce quite a response from the, from the fish. Um, but again, still early days there, nothing really, other than the chitin binding being uh, a, a very common across these that has, that has jumped out at us. So overall, uh, the lice abundances did not differ uh, between uh, the wild and farmed uh, source lice. The uh, farm source lice had overall higher lesion, grayscale scores suggesting greater damage was inflicted by the, by the parasite uh, that had that source uh, that were originating from farms. Uh, the initial RNA sequencing data results uh, demonstrate that there's uh, a significant uh, transcriptome difference between these two sources of lice, uh, and, and there might be some secretory potential there as, as we go and try and identify what uh, some of these genes are. So there are some trypsins and, and lectins, all things that we often see in, uh, when we're looking at uh, in terms of louse feeding and, and impacts that, that might be a virulence associated with the parasite. So there's still sequencing to be completed on the, on the host side of things and more analysis on what these, uh, what these genes actually are. Um, there's also an, uh, an evolutionary rate um, analysis on farm versus wild uh, uh, transcripts that Dylan's gone through as well. Uh, and basically what that is, is you're going through and estimating the rate of sequence evolution uh, to determine if there are, there's positive selection on one group of uh, of genes. So in this case, uh, there would be a group of uh, what would be considered as potential uh, virulence factors and compared against uh, maybe somatic genes, things that we don't expect to evolve uh, as quickly or have as much of an impact on the host parasite interaction. So the initial work that uh, Dylan has done has shown that the, these virulence factors do appear to be um, uh, there is a positive selection for them to evolve faster uh, compared to somatic genes. So the idea here is you have a greater number of, of non-synonymous substitutions that are in the, in the uh, virulence factors compared to our somatic genes, uh, which again would just kind of suggest that, um, that uh, selection is occurring uh, at a greater rate on these virulence factors than it would for any other kind of normal, uh, normalized or uh, standard cell function uh, gene. Uh, but there's still a little bit uh, of work to go there. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, Colin Kai and uh, our, our former postdoc in the group uh, out at uh, the DFO lab. Um, of course, Dylan, who did all of this work, and, uh, and I'm just here to collect the glory or to not butcher the uh, presentation. Uh, so I guess that's it. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>